So um, I'm now with Corinne Perlman and we're in front of her comic Show and Tell which uh, I consider to be a, a wonderful introduction to uh, the Graphic Decert exhibition. So Corinne, do you want to talk me through the comic and tell me about why you made it? Uh, yes, uh, well following on from what um, Sarah was saying earlier and indeed Diane as well, I was, um, I was one of these women cartoonists who were working quietly away doing autobiographical comics um, and uh, although I knew a lot of other kind of women cartoonists I thought um, you know my own cartoon work uh, was um, really quite a private affair and indeed a lot of my uh, this this particular this particular strip came from uh, a, a series that I did for the Jewish Quarterly and uh, I was originally invited to do the strips because I was a woman I was a cartoonist uh, I was Jewish and they had a special issue of the Jewish Quarterly on um, uh, that was going to be written by women. That was my introduction. Um, and uh, this, uh, when I, I met Sarah um, and uh, she actually introduced me to, um, she told me about the article that Michael Kamener had written. And um, I thought I'd sort of had a rather nice little niche for myself, just beavering away doing these kind of comics on autobiographical, autobiographical comics uh, on um, Jewish, on my Jewish past. And uh, so this, so this strip is called Show and Tell, and um, it actually uh, it delves quite a lot into my kind of negative emotions about this uh, amazing discovery that there were other women Jewish cartoonists who were also doing autobiographical comics and I didn't know about them apart from uh, Aileen Kaminsky Crumb um, and, uh, uh, and I, uh, I re that was in the very first, first strip I sort of wondered whether I was um, qualified in order to do these comics uh, because um, uh, you know, because I, I in fact have uh, an assimilated Jewish background and I didn't really kind of share many of the things that um, uh, you would associate with being, with being Jewish. So the strip is about actually being um, an assimilated North London Jew. Um, and uh, I include here, uh, and the, the strip is a bit about how I have all these... Um, this kind of guilt and uh, bad thoughts and so on and uh, I'm sort of constantly ranging around for something to feel guilty about and uh, and then I come across all these other cartoonists who are also doing the same thing so I sort of go through them and then I the cartoon questions kind of why it is that um, you know we should have all these kind of guilty emotions and so on and why we are so keen on autobiography um, and uh, I wonder at the end whether it's because we don't actually, you know, we're too worried about uh, what's happening out there in the world. Um, you know, issues such as kind of Israel and Palestine and so on. And it's much easier to um, concentrate on one's own immediate environment. Uh, this is uh, another... Well, the message of this, we're all going to die. And if you're Jewish, you have a very kind of restricted choice around London. Most of the burial grounds lie around the M25. Um, and uh, you might want to kind of, <laughs> you might want to think twice about booking yourself a plot in one of those. Uh, and this strip deals with uh, my personal horror of uh, having to rest in any one of these places um, and also kind of has a look at my parents, how uh, they uh, got very friendly with the, um, the local vicar in the uh, village that they were living in and um, he rather kind of kindly suggested that he, he might sort of speak a bit of Hebrew at their funeral and in fact that's what he ended up doing when my, my father died a few years ago. Um, uh, I like this strip because it actually, unlike most of the strips and unlike the two others that you've seen, I haven't crammed the dog basket and everything else in as well. Um, the strips were all, for the Jewish Quarterly, were all on two pages and some of them have about kind of 55 frames on them or even 60, which of course is mad. Um, and it's rather embarrassing to think that as an editor um, of graphic novels myself, there's absolutely no way I would let anyone else get, get away with 
sort of even, you know, 10% of that. And I can feel Woodrow in the background agreeing with me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yes, I like this uh, strip for its um, composition and the fact that it's a bit of a, a panorama and uh, it actually kind of shows the sort of regimented... Um, uh, the regimented vista of the um, of the burial grounds on the uh, M25 orbital with the cars roaring away in the background. Uh, thank you. I just ask a question. Yes. Um, I, I was talking to you earlier about your strips, and you said that sometimes you wish that you'd had an editor on them. <laughs> Um, so presumably some of them you feel more happy about than others. I mean, the composition in this one's lovely, mm. but the one about your gap year perhaps could have done with a couple more pages. There's yes, a yeah. lot of text in there. So yes, yeah. if you had the chance, would you expand some of them into more pages? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I have thought of doing it and I have tried. I mean, the, the, as a collection, there are, about, um, there are about sort of 18 strips that I did for this series. And there are... Um, you know, it's very varied, and I can see like there are th three here come from the um, earliest, uh, the earliest contributions I made to the magazine, and you know there are a lot of issues that I wanted to get off my chest, and I had great pleasure in drawing up, um, and I feel some of the later ones were a bit forced, and that I did actually. In the end, I was sort of playing the Jewish card. I was actually playing to the gallery in a bit, a, a bit, and I did actually. I didn't feel entirely comfortable about that, so um, I think I. And also, I wasn't necessarily pushing on to. I mean, some of the strips were quite serious. I mean, they weren't all kind of light-hearted, um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly. Um, there's certainly a possibility of, of uh, picking out the, um, the bits that I like the best and putting them into a collection. This is one of the series playing the Jewish card that I did for the Jewish Quarterly, and it's called The Gap Year. Um, and quite a few of the strips kind of look at how, um, you know, Jew even though you come from an assimilated background, somehow when you're a tourist or something like that, you... Um, you know, Jewish the Jewish past plays an enormous part in your um, on your holidays, um, and this particular one looks looks at the whole experience of a, a, a gap year. Um, and uh, I um, finished school in the late sixties, and um, uh, I didn't expect to have a gap year, but I did. And uh, the whole, you know, the, the world was my oyster. I was sort of wanted to go to New York. I was going to um, go to Iceland. I'd done a special geography project. And um, somehow I, and I have to say, ended up going to Israel with my friend Jake and a couple of other school friends. And I was, I, I was so cross with myself. And I, I, this was something that actually was very much uh, what other people were doing. And I obviously can see that I was going to do something really special. Uh, so uh, this, this strip is about my encounter with, um, uh, with Israel. And I, I say here, was it some latent genetic throwback uh, that in moments of crisis, adolescent Jews, without any discernible affiliation or faith, receive a call to pilgrimage? And then you have me in bed saying, oh, Israel. And uh, in the background, it's come to, come to me, my little kibbutznik. Um, so then follows a scene of uh, me in Israel with, of course, you know, uh, everybody kind of saying, listen, you're Jewish. You know, why aren't you living here? Um, and, you know, I was very, um, I was really kind of very childish. But all I wanted to do was to go and escape to the old city and put on my Bedouin velvet clothes mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, not have to kind of deal with any of that. Nevertheless, my favourite possession was actually my little Israeli army bag, which I was very proud of. And then, unfortunately, one of my, um, uh, my, my sister kind of pencilled uh, my um, Hampstead Garden suburb address on it and I, and I said is there no, no escape from NW11 <laughs> so uh, I had to kind of leave Israel after a couple of months because my athlete's foot was so bad I think it was like you know being a uh, tourist in the Red Sea it wasn't very good for it um, and, uh, and then there are a couple of frames at the end where uh, 
I sort of questioned my sister, threatening her rather wayward nephew, uh, her wayward son, saying kind of, you know, perhaps she should send him off to Israel. That would sort him out. And I wondered whether Israel deserved such, um, uh, such visitors. <laughs> Diane's in front of her really remarkable work, um, Baby Talk, A Tale of f Three Crossed Out Four Miscarriages. Very difficult to describe that title. Um, can I hand over to you to tell us about the work and um, how it is to see it now in its afterlife years after you produced it? Once again, the historian. Um, this started, actually did start out using, I have created a character called Didi Glitz and I thought I could tell the story of my own personal horrible experience with miscarriages through her or through her sister, Glenda, in this particular instance, but I couldn't do it. And so the, the part where I'm getting pulled out from behind the page is, was a very real experience where I had to, it was very scary and I had been doing a few things where I had a dialogue going between myself as a cartoon character and Dee Dee as a cartoon character, which was incredibly addicting to do. So once I started doing it, it just kind of flowed from there. She is the perfect counterpoint to whatever misery I'm feeling. You know, all she cares about is what color nail polish she's gonna get to wear. And in terms of being Jewish, I think this is only Jewish because I'm Jewish, you know, and I was Jewish in a half assimilated, half unassimilated way. Um, my parents were communist, but we went in on the weekend to my grandmother and aunt who kept kosher. <laughs> so it was a combo. And the story has been getting a lot of attention many years after I did it. and. I'm very happy about that, and I'm very happy that the subject is out there. I mean, when I started doing it, there was very little in the category of books about miscarriage, and there's a whole lot more now. But when I started, it just wasn't something you talked about. It was something that was incredibly painful and embarrassing. I remember going through a period where I had gained weight, and um, People knew I was pregnant, and then they thought I was still pregnant, and I couldn't handle it. You know, they asked me, you know, what month I'm in, and I have to say, <laughs> you know, no month, or I had a miscarriage, and that was very difficult. Um, Sarah was talking to me about that people seem to notice that the hair changes a lot. I assume that means my hair, not Dee Dee's hair, because her hair is kind of unmovable. <laughs> But um, I think it's just part of the emotional content of it, is the hair is expressing the emotion somehow. And it wasn't something I was conscious of at all. It just happened. Um, it's very interesting to hear people talking about it afterwards and asking me if it's a happy ending or not. A, you know, it's not a happy ending, but it does end on a joke. I'm a cartoonist. So um, I guess that's all. Can I ask you another question? Sure. Um, you were one of the, uh, you were making comics in the 1970s and onwards. Do you want to talk a bit about what it was like to make comics at that stage and in, in, in that era, you know, era? And, and now you're not making comics so much, you're making sculptures. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. Uh, I have to say that in the 70s, um, the women's comic collective degenerated into a lot of backbiting and fighting and it was not a whole yeah we're all women together and we'll spell it without the men and you know <laughs> it, it didn't work that way <laughs> and that's why in fact um, Aileen Kaminsky Crum and I did Twisted Sisters it was like we had actually had a reaction from a Jewish woman editor of women's comics saying we have too many Jewish women's stories in this issue <laughs> and didn't put Aileen's story in, which was insane. So um, we can thank her for Twisted Sisters, <laughs> which I am very proud of. Um, about the sculpture, I've been doing it for a long time. I actually started doing it when I was living in New York and I took some classes at the New School, you know, just figure modeling. And 
basically for a long time it was just anybody who would take off their clothes and stand in front of me, I was grateful because I wanted to sculpt. And I've been doing that for many years. Now it's started to take a weird turn where comics is coming back into it. I did a bar relief of Dee Dee and I haven't finished it, but I'm going to paint it and have it be very cartoony looking and make like plaques for word balloons and maybe make them interchangeable and do other characters. And I'm not quite sure where it's going, but it's just started happening, so. So, so I'm in front of uh, Dump Before Valentine's, which I made when I was dumped by Tim. Uh, before Valentine's Day, there you are, public humiliation. Um, and sucks. Yeah, there, there you are, there you go. Doesn't, doesn't, I'd like to say it doesn't really matter who, because there are an, a, quite a number of men who dumped me over a number of years. So it, this is just one of the many. However, I do believe that the creation of art, and then actually this is a sold artwork, I made money out of my own uh, uncomfortable uh, pain. So therefore, I think I, I win. You know, I may have been dumped, but I won. So that's it. And what I really like about this work is, is it's... Um, it's kind of bracketed by this bench inside the context of outside St Paul's Cathedral, looking at the um, looking over the river, and it ends in an isolated bench. When I've been dumped, I'm no longer in that context of a happy relationship. I've kind of become this kind of disjointed, uh, kind of isolated figure, um, and I want it to be that in the time it takes you to read the comic is the time it took for the phone call to happen. So you're also kind of bracketed by the phone itself, uh, ringing and and also the phone call ending so in it's kind of like you are part and privy of that conversation and that time um, and also there's this moment where you're you're looking out on the river as I'm having a conversation I'm kind of a holding on to the handlebar because you know when your life changes you need to hold on to something so it's kind of a, a visual <coughs> ploy to hold on to something while the rest of my life is in flux and obviously like the water I'm looking at you know everything's changing and you know one phone call can change things quite a lot and that was the experience that I had um, and there's this whole sense of kind of buildings and constructions and kind of order and obviously kind of emptiness afterwards because those are kind of the things that go through your mind when things are changing, the things that you hold on to, the structures and the constructs you hold on to, and then the kind of sense that, you know, in the end you're just this lonesome bench and you've got none of the old, the other things around you to hold on to and to make, give you a kind of a, an, another side to your life. Um, and I, I think that's it really. As the curator of this exhibition, why did you choose this piece for inclusion rather than, say, an extract from the Book of Sarah? Your These, this is actually part of the Book of oh, Sarah. Right. So the Book of Sarah is in my ongoing autobiography. It's a rewriting of the Book of the Bible, that because in the Bible, Sarah gets a very few words and then she dies. And basically, I think she and I should have more of an, a role. But also, I think in general, the women in the Bible don't, you don't follow their narratives. You always follow the men's narrative and the women are begetting children or kind of being, they kind of signposts for the men. And then you follow the man being a hero somewhere else. And I kind of want one book of the Bible just to be about a woman's life. And it's not even that remarkable, but I think it matters. So that's why it's called the book of Sarah. And um, in it, you just follow my life really. And moments I parallel, uh, certain parts of the biblical story of the book of Sarah she was had children later in life and I just had my first baby uh, only 10 months ago and there was all that question was it going to happen is it not going to happen and in the bible Sarah laughs when the angels tell her she's going to have a baby so uh, quite a lot of it's the idea that we've got moments of parallel in our lives but also it's this idea that there are probably number infinite number of women's stories that were never recorded and never noted and you know that's why we we have this one of the imbalances in literature we have um, even biblical literature um, so that's so it's me. It's just me and my life. That's what and it is. Why this piece in particular? Um, what I like about it is it's for me. It's quite transitional because it's that moment. It's actually quite acutely embarrassing at some level, and I've put that embarrassment on a page, and it's something that everyone relates to. Everyone's somehow you know been jilted by someone. You know, it doesn't matter what, what gender you're in or, 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 your, or your, you know, what relationship you're in or any of those things. You, everyone's had that feeling and it's, I like the fact that I took something that kind of pierced me a little bit and everyone can relate to it somewhere. And it can kind of give everybody kind of maybe a little, ju uh, little shudder about, gosh, I'm pleased I'm not going through that anymore. Uh, so, so, yes, I think that's, that's how it is. But I also like the fact that um, you can travel through an artwork and it can take you somewhere. You know, and literally are travelling through this place and these emotions and, and getting somewhere at the other end and I, I feel the way the you can show these drawings even though they're kind of large panels you feel like you're passing through time and space and I, I quite I think that they're quite successful for me.
that's probably why it's here. It's one of my better things. So um, this this three page uh, three well three page three panel comic is about um, called reciprocity and it's about meeting up for a friend for coffee and expecting it to be really nice and it being quite awkward and I made the um, tablecloth look like a chessboard because it was you know when you go out and sometimes it becomes like a whole game of maneuvers with someone how much you expose and and, and you know, tell about yourself and how much you you know make yourself sound really good when things aren't so great and all that those kind of games you play so I kind of wanted to suggest that in the in the tablecloth and the fact that it's kind of presented as it was when we were sitting opposite each other with our two cups of coffee and the uh, elephant ears kind of symbolizing kind of not listening to each other really but not having communication but the biscuits obviously standing sitting there like a pair of this whole set of ears and it's about um how I expected my friend to be happy for me and she wasn't and that kind of helped me realize that maybe this wasn't a very good friendship after all and how much I longed for the old days where friendship seems a lot less complicated and there were so many less things to worry about um, and once again I like the fact that when you present it say on a wall that you you get this sense of space and experience by the way the the panels are kind of set out thank you So I just spoke just now about how I was dumped and I'm handing over to Miriam Caton whose artwork here is about how she dumped someone. Would you go so far? Yeah, I dumped a lot of You dumped a lot of money. So she's probably the calm that I was receiving. Right. Thank you. So uh, this, uh, this short work uh, was commissioned uh, by a, a charming Jewish magazine um, that and, and I love small commissions because you can tell a, sh a short story that would not be in a book, wasn't, wouldn't be long enough. And um, this was, they asked for some story about acrimony and um, fight or acrimony. And this came to my mind, the years in the Israeli army, uh, IDF, but I was serving it was uh, 1960 to 63, and it was the first time I, I was happy to be out of the house, out of the, away from my mother and all these men. And also, I met up with uh, Middle Eastern men, Jewish Jews from Middle East, whom we didn't know anything about them at all. We didn't know they existed, and they were gorgeous. So, uh, so, uh, but but the way it starts, I was uh, I, I was a sergeant, and one of the jobs we had to do is to uh, organize uh, the night uh, guards guarding the camp at night. And um, this young man came up, and I made a joke about his name, and uh, the Moroccan and Algerian Jews, uh, they 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 were known to be. Uh, very, very, very touchy about how you talk to them, and especially the name. Name was a big thing, sacred name. And he, uh, he, he really uh, was very, very angry, very annoyed. I was a sergeant, he was a simple soldier, and I was white, and he was black. And he was very, very annoyed, and I, I got really sort of scared. And uh, we ended up... Um, um, well, <laughs> meeting and uh, end up to be a, a boyfriend for a while, charming and everything, but really, unfortunately, uh, I realized after a while that there was a tremendous gap between us. Uh, not, the, not that he wasn't a good man, or but I grew up with culture. I classic music and books and um, everything and he he just didn't have that he had something else but you know I couldn't from day to day uh, be with someone who really was that far away from me and uh, one of the, uh, uh, the one of the head of the our office that was there uh, he he told me you know, you really shouldn't date him because it's not for you. You know, they're not as civilized as we are. And I, I was very upset because he had on his arm, you know, he was in Auschwitz. And I said, how can one Jew say something about another Jew? Didn't we go through enough? And uh, 
as, as I said, sadly, the difference was enormous. And uh, it took decades after that, when I visited Israel, when I lived there actually in the 90s, uh, 80s, um, I see a lot of intermarriage. I saw second, third generation. So it looks much better now. Most of my stuff is uh, either autobiographical or social commentary. Um, and the stars in it are my girlfriend and me, and mostly our two cats, uh, <laughs> Rafi and Spaghetti, that can talk and have an opinion about everything, a strong opinion. Um, I've published two books. This is from my first book, Pink Story. Uh, it's about, uh, it's a graphic novel about the the, the history of the gay and lesbian community in Israel since the beginning of uh, the state until the beginning of the 21st century and also about my own personal story. This particular spread is uh, about the drug scene in uh, Tel Aviv in, uh, in the 90s. Uh, and the second book that I published uh, just came out a few months ago and uh, it's a collection uh, of uh, comics columns that I published weekly uh, in, a, in an ent entertainment magazine um, for six and a half years, every week, not easy. <laughs> um, and it was called Rishumon. Uh, Rishum in Hebrew is a, a drawing or a sketch, so Rishumon is like a small drawing. And it also refers to the Japanese movie uh, Rashomon. <laughs> that tells one story from different points of view. So the pages, the three pages here uh, are from the, the, that column. Uh, basically it was about uh, daily life in the city with some uh, personal stories and also about the uh, current affairs. Um, so those two are uh, a little similar, both of, the, both of them are about the past. Uh, in this one, uh, Spaghetti, the cat, wants to know uh, whether I had uh, boyfriends uh, before I found out, before I realized that I was gay. So I'm telling her the, the story about the most interesting boyfriend that I had as a kid. Uh, I'm responsible for the story, she's responsible for, to make the comics funny. <laughs> uh, that's her job. And we're sitting in the living room and behind us the uh, uh, two miniatures that this boyfriend gave me uh, before uh, he left Israel. And with them I make the connection in the comics between the present and the past. Um, this one also is also about the past. It's about uh, my grandparents uh, that lived in the States and came to visit us uh, every few months until they finally made the came to Israel uh, years later. Um, and also here, the, the connection between the, the past and the present is, is made with an object. This time it's with uh, the, the plate that spaghetti is eating from that used to belong to my grandparents. And of course, she suggests that she can get to know the story better if I give her some more food in their plate. Uh, and the third one is, uh, is different. Uh, this one I did after uh, Obama was uh, elected for the first time. Uh, this is Rafi. He's the only male in the house, and he's black. So he, he's, he became a big uh, Obama fan. <laughs> uh, so in this one, he, wanted, he asked me to draw him uh, with Obama in all the <laughs> events that took place uh, when he was sworn into office. Uh, so that's all that drawing. Uh, he, he wanted to be added to all the historical moments, and he's a cat, so it didn't seem uh, megalomanic to him or, <laughs> or anything uh, like that. Uh, and also there's a, there's a phrase here in Hebrew that I wrote a comment about. Uh, in Israel, when you meet someone uh, twice in a row, it's common to say, uh, a uh, third time ice cream, which means if we meet another time, we'll get ice cream. <laughs> so, uh, and Obama was, uh, he swore twice because, uh, I don't know if you remember, he got mixed up with the words. So, uh, this is the first time, and then in the second time, uh, Rafi says to the judge, uh, 
the third, his version of the of the phrase that the third time uh, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so and this is something that I always do. Uh, I try to translate the uh, human talk into cat talk. Uh, and this is the uh, original drawings uh, I draw with a pencil, and then I scan it and do the rest there uh, on the computer. That's it. Can I ask a question? Thank you. Do you, do you write in English or Hebrew usually? No, in Hebrew, and it's all very Israeli, so some of it is very hard to translate, and you lose some, some of it. So did you translate it, or did... Uh, it, the, I translated it with my girlfriend, who is American, right. and also my parents, uh, then we gave it to my parents, who are American, so, <laughs> so it's okay. Heat magazine approached me. They were had a special issue. The topic was the chosen, and of course, immediately I thought I'm not really one of the chosen because I am half Jewish and I am the wrong half. <laughs> so this was a comic sort of exploring that experience and my relationship to my own feeling Jewishness, and um, yeah, it's basically about when I was. Uh, Try, I was like moving apartments and so I lived, uh, my landlords were Hasidic and I basically led this Hasidic landlord to believe that I was a full Jew and he really liked me and then I was thrown into a paranoid spiral that he would somehow find out that like Lori's father I was an imposter. <laughs> this was just a completely random comic that I did I have no idea why. I guess it just, the urge struck me to draw a comic. Um, when I was home from college uh, over the holidays, and it's funny because my girlfriend who was here told me that, she was looking at it and she told me that before we had ever met, she'd seen this, I think in a graphic details show, maybe like four years ago, and that she read it and she was like, I have no idea what this person is talking about, <laughs> that it made no sense. And now that she knows me, she's like, I under she said she understood each panel explicitly. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of sort of just insider language and inside to my family, to myself, um, but that hopefully creates, paints a portrait of, you know, what it's like, I think to return from college and just like be in your total selfness again at home and that feeling of comfort and speaking in whatever language you use with your family and with your friends. Uh, and also, it's basically about being a hypochondriac because I went to like four different doctors in the two weeks that I was home. <laughs> and that's the comic. Okay, great. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You've just done a. That's great. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You've just written a book as well. Oh, like sure. Comics and talk about your, your, your history of comics and now not making comics. Yeah, so. Um, in addition to these short comics that I do, I also, I primarily wrote a series about being in high school, Berkeley High in California, um, one book for each year of high school. And then most recently, I was interested to try writing both fiction and prose. So I wrote a novel called Adam, which is uh, over there. And it was um, fictional in that it's about a teenage boy who ends up going and spending the summer with his older sister in Brooklyn but still kind of sticking to my autobiographical roots and that he really inhabits the world that I was in, which was this queer subculture of New York City in the early 2000s. And it is kind of a satirical look at that scene. Thank you. Um, I'm Laurie Sandell. These are four panels from a book that, I, um, that came out in 2009 called The Imposter's Daughter. And it was a graphic memoir, nonfiction account of um, finding out that every single thing my father told our family was a lie. And um, he's still married to my mom to this day. We haven't spoken in, since the book came out and before. Um, I basically grew up thinking that my dad was in the CIA. And uh, he sort of let us believe that he spoke nine languages, um, had six degrees from all these different universities. He was Argentinian and really just larger than life and fascinating. And um, you know, when I became a writer in my 20s um, and early 30s, I decided to interview him for a magazine article I wanted to write for Esquire magazine. So he came over to my house um, every week for two years, and I just recorded him talking about his life. 
And it sort of started to dawn on me in those two years that it couldn't possibly all be true. He had been like a Green Beret in Vietnam and like parachuted into the jungle with General Westmoreland. And he, you know, spoke all these languages. And I had heard him speak snippets of German and Russian and, you know, all these. And, um, and basically, I ended up going to Argentina and tracking down the relatives that I had never met because he was estranged from his entire family. And came to find out that, you know, he had not gone to these elite Catholic private schools. Even though he was Jewish, he claimed to have gone to Catholic schools because they were the best. And, um, you know, found out that he had not been in Vietnam. Um, he had been a private in the army, but had never been to Vietnam. Um, he had actually falsified his college credentials, um, his law degree. Every single thing was completely fake. And when I confronted him, he threatened to kill himself. Then he said he was involved in a big government fraud. Anyway, there's a book if you want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and this, you know, I did it as a graphic um, memoir because first, I'm really a prose writer and I've only ever cartooned about my father from when I was little. And uh, I just wrote it as a prose, you know, nonfiction book first and I just felt like it was so navel gazing and, you know, I was like, who cares about this story? And then when I you know, dragged my childhood cartoons out and there were like 500 of them all about my dad and I could see that I sort of knew everything from childhood. Um, I decided to explore it in graphic form and then I was, the story just kind of came out and, um, and this is the result, The Imposter's Daughter. And then this led to, by the way, um, me writing the nonfiction, uh, uh, the nonfiction authorized biography of Bernie Madoff's family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because they read my book and they um, said, oh my God, um, my dad's like your dad. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with the Madoffs, so that was interesting too. Yeah. <laughs>